Hello and welcome back to Simply Serie A, the Italian football podcast brought to you by Sofa Sports Media. On this edition, we'll be reviewing the big stories from the peninsula and looking ahead to the final match week. But before we kick off, let's run through last weekend's results. Chievo nil, Sampdoria nil, Empoli 4, Torino nil, Genoa 1, Cagliari 1, Juventus 1, Atalanta 1, Lazio 3, Bologna 3, Milan 2, Frosinone 0, Napoli 4, Inter 1, Parma 1, Fiorentina 0, Sassuolo 0, Roma 0, and Udinese 3, Spau 0. My guests on this week's edition are two uh, guests that have been on quite regularly this season. And if you're a regular listener to uh, the show, you will, of course, recognize Vittorio Campanile. Vittorio, how are you, mate? It's good to be back. Thank you. It's our pleasure, of course. And Adam Digby, welcome back to the show, mate. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Good to be back. Good. It's an absolute pleasure to have you as well. Right, guys, let's start off in Turin, where Atalanta earned a draw and now sit in the prime position to qualify for the UEFA Champions League. All they need to do is beat Sassuolo on the final day and they will be in Europe's premier competition. Vittorio, it's been an incredible season for Atalanta, hasn't it? Um, I kind of felt that maybe they'd bottle it towards the end of the season, but there's no sign of that. And, and how good have they been this year? It's really surprising because, you know, our listeners would, would remember that we were saying every week, you know, we don't believe that Atalanta will make it. Instead, they, they are there. Now they're third because Inter, as usual, when, when it's close to the target, disappeared and uh, yeah, they lost badly against Napoli. So na- now Atalanta has its third place with the same points of Inter. And, you know, now they're playing Sassuolo, who has nothing to ask to to the season anymore. So if they win, they, they, they will reach the Champions League, which is astonishing. And they keep playing great football. I mean, against Juventus in the second half, they were really knackered. And Juventus had the chances to win there. But, you know, Juventus is not very focused anymore uh, on, on the Serie A. And so, you know, the, the point was really, really important for Atalanta, especially after the Coppa Italia final. So... I think they deserve to be there. They are probably the team who played the better football in Serie A this year. So you know, big credit to them and Gasperini. Yeah, absolutely. It's been fantastic, hasn't it? It's been a great season. Adam, y- your thoughts on Atalanta? Did you believe that they would be here at this point in the season? Um, I think probably even uh, a third, maybe even halfway through the season. No, probably not. It's one of those like, oh, it's a nice story, but. Eventually, the the big boys are going to sort themselves out. But really, to take no, <laughs> I'm going to backhanded compliment this now, but to take nothing away from Atalanta. I I totally agree. I think they have played the best football in Syria. I think they're the most interesting team to watch in Syria. Um, their, their players have been fantastic. Their, their system from their coach Gasparini is is superb. It's very much in tune with the the modern way that we've seen Ajax and Liverpool and and Barcelona and, and the, all the top teams in Europe play over the past couple of years um, and something that Juve could definitely learn one or two lessons from themselves but really if we're completely honest as, as was just mentioned before they're level on points with Inter a point ahead of Milan and if either of those two had been anything close to consistent over the past three months we wouldn't be having this conversation and Atalanta wouldn't be in third place The the amount of points that Atala- that Milan and Inter have left on the table is is almost criminal. And really, it's a shame that both of them can't miss out for me because I think there's a very real danger of, if they do scrape in, um, of, of, of things going a little bit stale. I'm sure, in a way, that's probably not true of Inter now with, with the news this afternoon about Antonio Conte, which I'm sure we'll go on to discuss. But I think especially for Milan... I think if Milan do manage to overhaul Atalanta and scrape into a Champions League place, I think in the long run that could be damaging for them because I think they'd probably be tempted to keep Gattuso for a little bit longer. They probably wouldn't make the widespread changes that they need. And and as much as I want to praise Atalanta, I really hope that they get in the Champions League just so that we get the, something approaching the real Milan back sometime soon. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with that. Uh, Vittorio mentioned that, of course, Juve... 
have lost a little bit of focus. They look like they're on holiday. Their feet are up in, in Serie A, and that's understandable. But this week, of course, we saw the final game for Andrea Barzali. And of course, we have now know that Massimiliano Allegri will be leaving as well. Um, Adam, before I come to you on this with the Juventus insight, Vittorio, how would you sum up Allegri's reign at Juventus? Um, you know, has he been really good? or Because, you know, people from the outside that look into Serie A are kind of of the impression that anyone that's Juventus manager now could could win the Serie A because they're so dominant. But how would you assess uh, Massimiliano Allegri's time at Juve? Well, he won everything. But let's not forget when he arrived to Juve, if we remember, Conte left the second day, the first day of of training of that year, and a little click after, can we say failing with Milan? I, I, I'm not 100%. It was all Allegri's fault. I thought big part was the the club that sold all the big players, and Allegri found you know a Milan that wasn't that good anymore. But fans didn't want Allegri. Juventus fans hated Allegri, and they thought he was a loser, and he wouldn't be able to keep up what Conte did. Instead, he did even better because Conte brought Juventus back to win in, in the Serie A, but Allegri brought Juventus in the Champions League final. And uh, not only he was able to win in Serie A, but, you know, even in Europe, Juventus did much better than than with Conte. Uh, the problem is, in the last two years, it's even... I, I don't know... <laughs> what you think about but you know thinking about Ferguson and Manchester United I think these days it's not impossible it's impossible to stay in a club for so long even after five years something doesn't work anymore so um, I think something didn't work anymore in the club relationship with Allegri and so it was time to change but you have to say that Allegri did pretty much everything I think Fans would give him a lot of credits. Yes, they didn't win the Champions League, but let's not forget that Manchester City spent three times more than Juventus. Paris Saint-Germain spent four times more than Juventus and they didn't win the Champions League. At the end of the year, one team wins the Champions League and, you know, a lot of big clubs will fail that. So uh, I think he, he, he did very well. I agree. Adam, you're, as a Juventus fan, how would you sum up Massimiliano Allegri's reign? And how do Juventus now go about replacing him? Who's on your radar? Um, I think uh, I, I pretty much agree with everything you've said there, um, Vittorio, about uh, Allegri. He, he did an incredible job. He came in, in on the second day of preseason, the most incredible circumstances after Conte just decided to walk away. Um, and go and work for the Italian national team for more money, um, despite professing to be a, a, a true Juve, a Juventino, which is something else we probably come on to discuss in a short while. Um, and then, unfortunately, he he took a club who who were struggling to draws with. Um, Ma- I'll probably get the names of these teams wrong in some order, but there were there were games against Malmo and Jur Gardens and Nordschland. Um, and and another uh, Scandinavian team who I forget, uh, and and a loss to Galatasaray that eliminated Juve from the group stage of the Champions League the season before Allegri came, and he took pretty much the same team. Uh, Juve only added Pereira and Morata in the season, in the summer that Allegri came, and he took the team to the Champions League final straight away, won a league and cup double, uh, the first uh, Coppa Italia win for Juve for twenty years. Then he he won the league and cup double again, which is just it, I, something I noticed when I was researching an article this week that I knew already but had kind of forgotten. No team had ever won back-to-back league and cup doubles in Serie A before. And then Allegri has now done it four times. It, it, that's incredible. No team had ever won the Coppa Italia more than two years in a row before. And Allegri did that four times. No manager had ever won the uh, Serie A title more than four years in a row. Allegri has done it five times. Wow. It's, 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 it's an incredible, incredible streak. He's got two Champions League finals in there, but unfortunately, the the glass ceiling on Juve's accomplishments of, of dominating in Serie A and, and, and not achieving the ultimate success in Europe remains there. Allegri raised that glass ceiling to as high as it can possibly go without quite smashing it is probably the best way I can put it. And, and, and all those teams who've spent, like you say, you talk about PSG, Man City, Chelsea, you spend all that money, you don't win in Europe. I, I think there's a, a very um, true 
uh, I have a very uh, heartfelt belief that a team, a specific team, has to get battle scars before it can go and win the Champions League. I don't think anybody just comes along and, and walks to the title. But unfortunately now, Juve have got battle scars that are 23 years old and, and they're still waiting. Uh, and Allegri's ultimately paid the price for that because the, you look at the team and Bonucci, Chiellini, uh, sorry, Chiellini and Ronaldo are both 34. Neither of those two's got very long left at the highest level. Mandzukic is 33. And then you've got a few other players in their 30s too. Pjanic is almost there. Chesney is almost there. Matuidi. And, and the window is getting smaller and smaller. And when you pay all that money for Cristiano Ronaldo, you want to go and win in Europe. And now you then need somebody who can. I think for, for the second part of your question as, as who's on my read, I think that the same people who were here and connected to the club, I think the Pep Guardiola idea is nothing more than a, a pipe dream. I don't see that happening in any way. I think there's a very realistic chance now that the, with the news today, as again, um, that is probably Maurizio Pochettino and, and Juve just being fair to Tottenham by waiting until after the Champions League because it's, uh, it, it wouldn't be fair to them. Um, but for me, he's the guy. I think he could bring the modern style that Juve need. He can kind of push them a little bit more and, and bring them into the area that they want to be in and, and, and continue to raise their profile off the field the way that they have done. I think he's probably the one I would say. I mean, as an Arsenal fan, I'd love to see Pochettino leave from Tottenham because ever since he's come along, it's been a really... Uh, what, uh, all the ringing endorsements you could hope to get with that as one. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, Vittorio, who, who do you think is, is the most suitable candidate for this job? It is one of the biggest jobs in world football. And, you know, despite what people think about Serie A, as Adam's already alluded to, it's not easy to win so many titles back-to-back and to keep a club at the very top, who would you like to see come in? Who do you think is the most suitable candidate? I have to agree with Adam. You, you know, uh, Juventus is looking to win the Champions League finally. So I think in their mind, they're looking for a manager who has succeeded in Europe, who has experience of competing and having success in Champions League. So that's why I don't believe the name of Simone Inzaghi is really the name Juventus is looking for. I totally agree with Adam. I think the the Tottenham manager is the right the right name. He already said that he's probably leaving Tottenham after the Champions League final because what can he do more with, with that club? So I really believe Juventus is looking for him. Pro- probably, as far as I know, they contacted uh, Guardiola because obviously that was the biggest dream. And but it's very tough to, I mean, if if UEFA doesn't decide to ban Manchester City from the Champions League, which could happen, but it would be far away, it could be end of June or beginning of July, so it would be too late for for Juventus to wait for Guardiola. So I think at the moment the only the only chance they have is Tottenham manager. There have been rumors of Mourinho, but I don't think Mourinho would fit for what Juventus is looking Juventus is looking in for a manager who plays nice football uh, a little bit the opposite of Mourinho and second I don't think the fans would accept to have Mourinho on Juventus bench yeah I, I agree with that as well um Adam you mentioned Conte there you spoke about him being a, a true Juventino well it looks as though he's going to enter how does that make you feel as a, a Juve fan is it feel like betrayal yeah, it does, uh, to be completely honest. I mean, I, I, and unfortunately, it's not the first time. The, the guy was a, an incredible captain for Juve. He was a, an unbelievably good coach. He, he transformed the club from basically kind of where Fiorentina are right now to the, the machine that they are today. And, and that was an incredible, incredible feat. Then he walked out on the second day of pre-season training to take a job with the Italian national team, which, it, as we know, is run by the Italian FA, which suspended Antonio Conte for, for three months. And, and Juve backed Conte in that fight from a, a, a match-fixing scandal from his time at Siena, which he wasn't directly involved in, but they said that he must have had knowledge of it because he was the coach and blah, blah, blah. And, and he railed against the Italian FA for months and months and months in press conferences and then went to work for them. So the fact that he then goes to work for Inter, then the only thing that he needs to do now is is take Inter's side in a Calciopoli argument in a press conference <laughs> and it, the, the whole thing will be complete because it, it really is a betrayal. I mean, the, the guy has, has railed against Inter, against uh, Calciopoli, everything. 
and then he's gone to work for he's apparently going to work for them. So fair play to him, good luck. He's not the first Juve manager to go off and manage Inter. I think if I put aside my my feelings about him as a as a man now, I think as a coach, he's exactly what Inter need, isn't he? He can do exactly the same thing Jose Mourinho did there and just cut through all the nonsense, all the 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 pads are into the the into craziness that exists and and really turn them into a force because for me I've said this before to you guys and I've written it in articles into have the second best squad in Serie A but they don't perform anything like that on the pitch and and really without needing to commit too much to Europe because they would just be glad of some domestic success I think he can really drive them on and and really give Juve who will be in a a, a, a semi transitional phase at absolute best with a new manager now after Allegri has left, I think we could actually have a title fight on our hands next season. A, a genuine one, not sort of one that fades away by February or March. I hope so. I hope so indeed. Um, Vittorio, let's talk about the Coppa Italia final. I know you're desperate to talk about this. Your side Lazio uh, lifting the trophy for the seventh time. Um, obviously, you were pleased with the, with the outcome, um, but there's a lot of talk about Simone Inzaghi Give me your thoughts on the final first, and then we'll talk about Simone and Zaghi's future. Well, it was a tough final for Lazio because Lazio was pretty much playing at home because it was in Rome, but against the team that probably is playing the best football in Italy. So it was complicated. And Lazio lost twice in Serie A against Atalanta, the last one a couple of weeks ago, 3 1 at home. So it wasn't easy, but Inzaghi prepared this match much better than the others. And something you have to say about Simone Inzaghi is that he's quite good in the Coppa Italia. He, he's very good. Uh, you, Lazio, to reach the final, had to beat Inter away and Milan. So it wasn't really easy. Um, Atalanta played better in the first half. In the second half, uh, Lazio played much better, which is bizarre because all season long, Lazio dominated in the first half and collapsed in the second but at the end, for me, the biggest difference was made by the key players. Um, if Gomez, Ilicic and Zapata are playing for Atalanta, there's a reason. They're very good players, but they are not star players. They are not the players that in key matches make the difference. While on the other side, you have Correa, Miniko Savic, that maybe didn't play that well this season, Miniko Savic, but he, he could be the best midfielder in Europe. So And they show it in, in the cup final, so that's why Lazio won. Talking about Inzaghi, well, obviously, he, he, there have been a lot of fans uh, complaining about him, uh, looking how Lazio uh, did bad this season in Serie A. And Lotito as well didn't protect the manager as expected in the last matches. And now after he won, he won the cup, he's taking a little bit of revenge, I think. He wants to talk with Lotito and say, OK, I stay, but at my condition, I want a big transfer market and not the usual unknown players that come from Belgium, Ligo, whatsoever. I want a big team to fight for the Champions League final with the same players, same quality players that Milan, Roma and Inter has. So I think that for this reason, he doesn't want to talk now because he wants to have the guarantee from uh, Lotito that he is going to have the big team. And on the other side, I think Adam has agreed on that. I don't think Juventus contacted him, Zaghi, because the first name is Pochettino or maybe Guardiola, etc. I, I think Inzaghi is the plan C, probably. And uh, so Inzaghi is still waiting to see if Juventus calls him. But in the meantime, he's thinking, well, I want to have the guarantee that this summer Lazio is going to buy big players. And that's that's fair enough, isn't it, Adam? I mean, he's a young, ambitious manager. He's done relatively well at Lazio. He's got every right to demand, uh, you know, backing in the transfer market, has he not? Yeah, but I think he's asking for it from the wrong guy. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we've seen Lotito do this before. He'll he'll stick with his plan and he won't overspend and he won't stretch himself. And it, it's just, uh, it, th- there's a very fixed, ceiling on what Lazio can achieve I think getting in the Champions League is exceptionally difficult for them Um, they did really really well to win the Coppa Italia I think one really underrated thing that they did is we've seen Atalanta all season um, high pressing up the pitch and snatching the ball back but Lazio really played as fast as they can getting into their penalty area and then conceded possession they dropped right off Atalanta 
um, which meant that when they did win the ball, they could just knock it forward to Immobile and Correra and, and just hit them on the break and not really allow Atalanta's midfield to to press the ball and win it back in Lazio's half, which is uh, which which negated their strength really, and and that was really incredible after, like Vittorio said, the the three one win just a week ago for Atalanta against Lazio. So they deserve huge credit for that. And in, Inzaghi is a good manager, but I I don't believe that Juve would look to him. I think you look at. You have a 34-year-old Cristiano Ronaldo. You need to win the Champions League in the next year, two years maximum, really. It's hard to see a 36-year-old Cristiano Ronaldo carrying you to a, a title. So really, you've got next season. You, you don't have time to wait for Inzaghi to get his feet under the table, to get used to it. And and you know that Conte is going to Inter, so you're probably going to get pushed. You know that Ancelotti's had a year already with Napoli, so he's going to be better. You know that Milan are going to do something serious if they miss out on the Champions League. There's going to be big changes there. Even the domestic success that Juve have had is under threat next season. And, and going for somebody like Simone Inzaghi would be a, a huge, huge gamble. I, I think that that's just a non-starter for me. But yeah, Inzaghi deserves all the credit in the world. And he, he probably is going to have to leave Lazio to, uh, to achieve his goals as a manager. Um, if he has goals other than manage Lazio, because he was he was quite happy to stay with Lazio for a long time as a player, even when he was a backup. So I guess we'll just have to see what his ambitions are as a manager now. But um, yeah, for the rest, he, he, he's superb. He's done a very good job. I think he has a, a bright future. Um, but I, I just don't see that being at Juve. Absolutely. Uh, Vittorio, I was just talking to you before we came on air regarding the reports that Milan are after Inzaghi. What do you make of that? Is that a real possibility? I think Milan is going to change manager for sure this summer. Now, they still have a chance to make it to the Champions League. It's going to be difficult because obviously Inter and Atalanta has a point uh, point ahead of them. Um, so Milan is looking for a new manager and obviously Inzaghi did well this season, so they could be looking for him. Uh, the biggest question, Mark, I have is what will Milan do next year? Because let's not forget that Milan could miss the, the Europe League next year because UEFA, they, they, they didn't, <coughs> I mean, the, in the last six years, Milan didn't uh, uh, respect the financial fair play. So I think this summer they're going to be penalized for sure from UEFA. Otherwise, the financial fair play is going to be a joke. So would you go in a club that won't play Europe for, I don't know, one, two years and will be limited this summer? That's, that's the biggest question mark for, for Milan. Uh, and again, I know Lazio is a team that need to do something special to reach the Champions League. But I think this summer is going to be really, really interesting because uh, Inter is going to change a lot. But if Milan and Roma fail to get to the Champions League, they will be forced to sell a lot of players. And so, you know, next year for Lazio, it could be easier to compete for the Champions League. I don't believe Atalanta is going to build a big team. There are already rumors of people leaving. So, you know, maybe next year uh, Lazio could have more chances because we're going to have to see what happened with Milan and Roma this summer. If they don't get to the Champions League, uh, they're going to have to sell big players. Absolutely. Um, Adam, we've touched on it a few times in passing so far. The race for the Champions League places, of course, Atalanta, Inter, Roma, Milan. Um, you know, there's, there's lots of people that can still get in there. Um, how do you see this one panning out? Are you set on, on a couple of teams making it or, or do you see there being a twist and a turn perhaps on the last day of the season? I think for me, looking at the the teams, I think the most important thing is when you look at the, the last few weeks of Serie A, you really have to look at what teams have left to play for because it's very, very rare that a team with nothing to play for gets any kind of positive result in Syria. It's, a, it's always been that way. It's a, a real quirk of, of Italian football that, that teams really do just roll over when they their season is over, including Juve, as you said, at the top. Um, so I think for me, I think Atalanta will win against Sassuolo, which will be a very strange game because Atalanta have having the stadium rebuilt. So they're playing their last two home games of the season at Sassuolo. But their last home game of the season on Sunday is against Sassuolo. So they're playing at Sassuolo, against Sassuolo. But Atalanta are the home team. 
and they'll probably have more fans too, so it could be a really weird atmosphere there. Um, then uh, Milan, uh, I think they will win too because they're playing... Uh, now my mind's just gone completely Spal. blank. Spal. They're playing Spal, who have nothing to play for themselves. And then, and then we come to Inter, who are playing Empoli, who, who need a point to stay up for definite um, and might even need a win. And, and we know what Inter are like. So for me, there's the twist. I think... I think both Atal- Atalanta and Milan will win, but with Inter, you, you really just never know, and, and they're the one team playing something, somebody with something to play for. So I think it really lies with Inter what happens. I think Atalanta, for sure, are going to make it because I don't see anything other than a win for them. I think Milan are going to do what they need to do, which really leaves us with, with Inter Empoli, and I, I, for me, that's just too close to call, even though it's at San Siro. Vittorio, how, how are you feeling about the race for the Champions League? Yeah, and let's not forget that uh, Empoli is only one point ahead of Genoa, who would be relegated at the moment. And Genoa is playing against Fiorentina, who, <laughs> since they changed the manager, <laughs> didn't win a match. I think they drew one and lost ev- all, all the other matches. And if Genoa wins, uh, Empoli wins, you know, Fiorentina could go down, which is unbelievable. Uh, Udinese so, have to win too. Yeah, yeah. Well, even a draw for Udinese would be fine. Udinese, and yeah. they're playing against Cagliari, so, you know... They're both Cagliari safe, so it could happen. It, it would be unbelievable, but it could happen. So, you know, Empoli cannot go uh, at San Siro and say, OK, you know, uh, we don't we don't care. We ha- They have to be careful. They have to be following what happened in the other matches because if Genoa wins, they go down. So they cannot allow to, to lose against Inter. And uh, so... And Inter lost 4-1 against Napoli last week. And Napoli didn't have nothing to ask because they were already sure to be second. And it was a disaster from Inter. Who need, you know, with a, with a point, Inter would have been pretty much already in the Champions League. Instead, they lost against Napoli who had nothing to ask. Now, the biggest question for me is, I saw Atalanta not playing as Atalanta in the Coppa Italia final. Because those players haven't got the experience of big matches. Now, my biggest concern is they're they're playing at home, but they're playing at Sassuolo. They're going to have a lot of pressure all week long, thinking we need to win, we need to win. It's final, we get the Champions League. So there could be even this risk. We saw Sassuolo even last week, you know, playing for nothing and and getting a result. So it's going to be important. You know, Sassuolo drew against Roma last week and pretty much... uh, took off Roma out of the race of the Champions League. So Atalanta has to be careful. They have to be really focused and not feel too much pressure because they are not an experienced team to to play for the Champions League. So this could be a risk. But after that, I agree. I mean, I think Milan will beat Spal. The question is what Inter will do. Yeah, absolutely. And guys, you mentioned Fiorentina there. That was going to be sort of my next discussion point, the battle for survival. Adam... How on earth has this happened to Fiorentina? If I'm not mistaken, their last win was on February the 7th. I read that somewhere today. And, you know, this is a team that not so long ago on this very show, we were talking about the potential they had within their squad. What on earth has gone wrong in Florence? Um, I, I think it's a combination of a few things for Fiorentina, really. I think the the team, the team is does have a lot of promise, but it does have a lot of flaws too. I think the, the midfield is, is really terrible. Um, I think outside of uh, Jordan Vertu, the, there's not really a, a Serie A quality midfielder in there for me. I think Marco Benassi is really, really mediocre and his, his poor quality is masked by the number of goals that he's managed to score this season. I think he's scored, he's scored six goals and, and watching Fiorentina regularly... I would struggle to to make a list of 10 positive things he's done this season if I count those six goals as one of each. Um, and I, I really do think they struggle with that. I think they struggled in the early part of the season for points quite a bit before they signed Muriel, who brought them a few goals in the early part. Um, and then I think when they sacked Stefano Pioli, who really had to go because he was really having no effect on the team, um, I think the whole momentum that they had from when Davide Astori died I think the whole squad kind of just relaxed and they'd been doing it in the memory of Davide Astori for so long that, that they were kind of held together by that. And I think Piola leaving, the, the manager who guided him through all of that, 
I think that kind of let those players finally relax and, and stop grieving and, and move on a little bit. And I think they might have unfortunately done it a week or two too early. And, and now we see the position that they're in. And, and now they've got to pick themselves up and they really have had some really terrible results the past few weeks. And, and somehow they've got to, to find a way to, to get something against Genoa because Genoa are the, in the relegation place at the moment. So even a draw for Fiorentina would would be a, an incredible result. It would be enough to uh, to see them uh, manage to uh, to stay up, and and it really is incredible that we're talking about this because I think even even in February there was still an outside chance that Fiorentina could get a, a, even a Champions League place and definitely a Europa League place. They were they were right there in the top seven eight places and and in with a real chance and they they did have a lot of quality and they did look very promising. And they do still have a lot of quality in, in various departments of the team, but they, they really need to get it to click on Sunday. It's a, a, a really sobering thought to think that, that they could actually be relegated as as, um, as really difficult a chance that is. It's still incredible that it's a possibility. It is, it is isn't it? And uh, Vittorio, they're going to be without Vincenzo Montella. I mean, what on earth was he playing at, at the weekend? I mean... You know, I, I, I've only seen the incident today. I know a lot of people uh, haven't seen it. So do you want to just let them know what he did and why he is now banned for the final game of the season? Well, uh, he was so nervous. He complained about the ref and uh, shouted at the ref. I, I don't remember what exactly he said, but obviously it was a bad word. And so he got suspended for too much. But maybe it's even better because since he got on Fiorentina, and again, you have to tell me, and now I'm serious, Montella have left Fiorentina because he did have a disaster there after starting well. Went to Milan, was a disaster. He has been sacked. And I always said Gattuso is not a great manager, but he did much better than Montella. He went to Sevilla and was a disaster there. After four years that he's managing badly, how can he come back to Italy and go to Fiorentina instead of starting back from Chievo? I don't know, a small team. This is something that blows my mind. I don't understand. He, he's been a disaster. And then he starts complaining about the ref. I, I think one of the biggest reasons is Pioli lost the locker room, I thought, at a certain point. But Montella it, it was the worst decision ever. And I think some of the key players, like Federico Chiesa, have already left F- Firenze with their mind. Chiesa is already focusing on going to Juventus or Inter. And I think there are a lot of players there who are thinking more about themselves, proving that they are quality players more than playing for the team. And, uh, you know, if you take off Chiesa, Simeone, that is not a great player, but, uh, you know, has the garra, as you say in Argentina. If you take off the garra out of Simeone, he's not an incredible striker. Um, Lafont has been a disaster. Uh, Mirayas uh, is another player who turns on, turns off, etc. So you need a manager more like Mialovic than Montella, who has been a disaster everywhere he has been. So, yeah, I think even the club has big responsibility because they, 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 they sent away pretty much Pioli because they didn't trust him. And then you replace him with, with Montella, who has been a disaster everywhere he's been. So, yeah, I think it's going to be tough because Genoa has to get points. And uh, Fiorentina is going to be in a tough situation, even if they play at home. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how it develops. I agree with you guys that I don't think it's very likely. I just want just have to say I I don't really agree with that. I think the players they're not focused on being elsewhere for me. I I mean I, I watch Fiorentina pretty much every week, um, and I don't see players who want to be somewhere else. I see players who just don't want to be playing football right now. They, they they've been through the worst possible human tragedy, and I think cheapening that by saying Federico Chiesa wants to be at Juve or Inter, I, I think that's really out of order to be honest I, I I really do I think I really feel for these guys they're really young they, they've been put through the the worst the worst emotions imaginable and and I also think with Montella Montella wrote his thesis uh, at Coverciano that every Italian coach has to do about um, the quality of physical training and its importance to players with particular emphasis on pre-season and I think you look at his career and everywhere he's gone in mid-season, Sampdoria, Sevilla, and now Fiorentina, 
He's struggled when he hasn't had preseason. But if you look at the teams he's been at when he has had preseason, Fiorentina before, he got them fourth. He got them to the semi-finals of the Europa League. He got them to the semi-finals of the Coppa Italia and won the first leg against Juventus. He is the only manager since 2011 to win a trophy with AC Milan. I, I think to say that he's a disaster as a manager is really unfair to him as well. And I, I, I think this is just a, an awful, awful um, series of events that have led to this position for Fiorentina. But I, I just think that to, to dismiss Montella as a manager and to, to cheapen what's got happened to these young men is, is, is really, really unfair to everybody. And I, I, I think that even if there were no changes to Fiorentina's squad, or the coach. I think when next season starts, we'd see a very different team and we'd see some people needing to very quickly rethink what they think about everyone involved because I think there's a lot of misconceptions from people who, who really aren't watching very closely what's happening and has happened in Florence. And I think it's all too easy to, to just dismiss it in the way that we generally talk about football. Vittorio, do you want to respond to, to well, that. last year when Gattuso took Milan, Milan wasn't running and they all complained about the preparation, summer preparation that Montella did. So I don't agree totally yeah, with what but, you said. But, but, but let's, let's, let's go back. OK, we want to talk about Montella's Milan. OK, let's do it. So Montella went to Milan in 2017, right? Uh, 2016. He had a young team, a team with the likes of uh, Locatelli, uh, Donnarumma, Romagnoli. And he went and he won a trophy. He went and he won a trophy. And he got them back into Europe. That's no small feat from where Milan were when he arrived there. Then the following summer, we had Mirabelli take over as sporting director. And he went, oh, I want a Kalinic. I want Bonucci. I want this guy, Bilia. I want that guy. And he put together a team of age, of older veteran players who all had an opinion. Let's not forget Nikola Kalinic walked out on Croatia at the World Cup who went on to play in the final because he didn't like being a backup. He was a backup at Fiorentina, a backup at Milan. So you can only imagine what he was like behind closed doors. The project at Milan completely changed and Montella struggled. Montella struggled to fit Bonucci into a, a four-man defence because he didn't want to play in it. He wanted to play in the three. To me, writing off what Montella did at Milan because of that second season completely ignores what he achieved in his first I totally disagree, but you know it's your point of view. God, do you want anything else to add, Vittorio, on that? Or well, I think Montella did started pretty well his career as a manager. He did well at Roma, Catania, Fiorentina. Then in Milan, he did well the first season, even though he was lucky to win that trophy. But after all, I mean, you have. Big players there, you know, Biglia was the key player of Lazio, you know. It's not that they, they bought him uh, the worst player of the league. Uh, Kessi, look Kessi now, <laughs> look like, like he, last year and so on. So I think, yeah, Milan, Mirabelli and, uh, and Fasone made a disaster overpaying a lot of players. But you cannot say that that team was bad. And how can you explain that Gattuso come in and change things, you know? He didn't bring them to the Champions League, but Milan was playing much, much better with Gattuso than with Montella. So, okay, interesting. Uh, the, stuff. The, the last, the last thing I would say about that is when Milan sacked Montella, they were seventh. Gattuso finished sixth. So uh, let's not. Oh, Gattuso saved the day. He did this. He did that. He uh, he finished one place higher than Montella had Milan. Yeah, and I and I read Gattuso not a good manager, and I always said it. That's but, true. So, Vittorio does so, say that week in so, week out. <laughs> yeah, so to me, the, the problem in that season was the Milan squad and Mirabelli, not the coaches. Both co both coaches struggled, and there's a reason for that. Milan are still probably not going. Well, might not get into the Champions League this season. They they start this weekend in fifth place. They could end up maybe even sixth if they don't get a result against Spal. So. Things are not great there still. And I, I think pinning that on Montella is kind of too easy. I, I, he did struggle. He definitely struggled. And he made mistakes too. But I, I don't think he's at, really at fault there. And I think the same is true right now at Fiorentina. There's a, a lot more going on there than a, a, a manager who's struggling. 
Well, I mean, obviously, it's not all, all Montella's fault in Fiorentina. As I said, the club has big responsibility, the players as well. Otherwise, you wouldn't explain a collapse like that. You know, it's not only the manager. But, you know, you, you have to think even about a manager who should have experience and should help the situation. I think what, I mean, it's been a fantastic debate between you two guys. And as I always say, your knowledge is far better than mine. The only thing I would probably add into that is, I get where Adam's coming from in the sense that a lot has gone on at Fiorentina and it's not totally his point. But from the other point of view as well, and I guess where Vittorio is coming from is you can't go into a club and at this club hasn't won a game for God knows how long. At some point, the manager has to take responsibility for the results. That's what a manager's job is. So to say that it's not because of Montella, I think isn't right and I don't think it's right to say it's all because of Montella I think you need to be somewhere in the middle on this yeah that's fair all right that wraps up that uh, little debate it was a great debate guys um, let us know what you guys think about it of course as well tweet us at simply Syria and let us know um, your feelings on that one now uh, going to move on to a couple of listener questions that have come in uh, throughout the day uh, this first one I'm going to put it to you Adam because it's Juventus related uh, this comes from uh, finally Farouk on Twitter he says do you think Allegri misread the Bonatia situation? Could he have done better with Dybala also? Um, I think if I answer that in backwards way around, um, with Dybala, no, I don't think he could. I think he's tried Dybala in, in a countless number of positions. He's, he's tried him with countless different combinations of players and he's just not been very good this season. He's scored three goals since December. He's, he's scored goals against the likes of Bologna, Frosinone, and, and struggled really in big games outside of a one goal against Manchester United that was way back in, I want to say, October. Um, and a goal against Milan, which, take that whichever way you want. Um, <laughs> I, I, I don't think Dybala's had a good season at all, and I think he really has struggled to, to play alongside Ronaldo, which is something I've, I've written about at length a couple of times this season. Um as for Benatia, yeah, Allegri made a real mess of that for me. Uh, last season, uh, you could make a strong case for, the, for me that ben, uh, Benatia was Juve's best defender. I think he was probably a little bit better than Giorgio Chiellini, although obviously Chiellini as captain is a, a, an important figure to the team. Um, Benatia was excellent last season, um, but this season he was, he was told by Allegri that he was still important, but then they, they re-signed Bonucci, Bonucci and the team struggled a little bit in the first few weeks and it really relegated Bonatti to a bench role and he continued to play Bonucci Chiellini trying to get Bonucci back into form and, and completely alienated Bonatti and I think that was a real blow because Bonatti could have been useful in the second half of the season but by the time December came he was he'd completely had enough and he wanted to leave and then he did leave and it, it really left Juve short in defence because Rugani is is nowhere near ready to be playing for Juventus if he ever will be ready. Um, I've made my feelings quite clear on that already. So, yeah, Dybala, no. Benatia, yes. Okay. Uh, and, and if I can jump in, yeah, go for you it. don't replace Benatia with uh, Casares, who is hardly playing uh, for Lazio. You know, I, I can understand that Casares goes back to Turin, all the memories of winning, etc. But still, I think Casares is a, a, a former player He's not that player that were playing for Juventus years ago. And you can see it in Rome. He was hardly playing. And so, OK, if you have to leave Benatia, who I think was a terrible mistake, you have to replace him with a quality player. Yeah. And Casares wasn't. And he showed it. Now, a little bit in the last matches, he played a little bit better. But he's not that level. And I don't know, and I don't think so, that that cost Juventus the Champions League. But having more options there would be obviously a benefit. And Benatia was still a very good defender who, who needs to feel the trust of the manager. And Rugani, for me, it's a good defender, but not that level Juve wants. I don't think he's a Juve player. Let's put it like that. He's, he's good. Maybe he likes you, etc., but not that level. So you needed to buy someone else to replace Benatia, who couldn't be Cáceres. Come on. I think that's even worse... <laughs> decision yeah. Allegri made you. Yeah, I think signing Casares is definitely a, a mistake. I think if you're behind behind Bastos in the 
pecking order, you, you really are struggling as a defender. <laughs> um, and he, he, is, he is a little bit past it now, Caceres probably. He, his explosiveness was probably his greatest quality. That seems to have faded very badly. He was used to playing in a back three at Juve and Juve don't play that way anymore. He's he, he's just not got what it takes. And I totally agree with you about Rogani. He's, I, I, he's I good, think, but he's not Juve good. I, I think the only... I, reason why they, they signed Casares is because he can play in different position. He he can play in the, the three man defense, he can play left back, right back, central defender, etc. So it gives you a lot of option. Even in the three five two he can play yeah, yeah. can play on but he can give you a lot of you know option, but you need quality at that level. And unfortunately he hasn't got it anymore because you know yeah. So I think that's what was a costly mistake. I, I'm not sure it cost the Champions League, but already you had a lot of injured players because let's not forget that Juventus played the key matches for the Champions League with a lot of injured players. Yeah, but I think I think to 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 back you up, I think to to say signing losing Bernati and signing Casares cost Juve the Champions League is hard. But I think if you look at it a different way. Not having Benatia meant that you couldn't rest Bonucci and Chiellini as much as you probably wanted to. And then they started to pick up injuries and then they can't play in the Champions League. And then you have to play Rugani, where yeah. if you could, you could trust Benatia more, whether that's in the Champions League or in Serie A matches so you can rest the other guys. It, it, it had a knock-on effect. So yeah, I think it definitely played into it. I think the, the midfield issue is clearly a bigger one and, and Dybala not clicking with Ronaldo is another, but it, it definitely plays into it, and I, I, I totally agree. I think that the, the mess Allegri made of Benatia, and that was Allegri. Benatia w- didn't want to leave just because he, he wanted to, to to go and try a new experience. He left because he wasn't playing at Juventus. If he was playing, he would have stayed, and 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 that's all down to Allegri. Nobody else. Absolutely agreed. Uh, let's move on to the next question. The next one comes from Nathan. He asks about the Champions League race, but we've already covered that. Thank you for your question, though, Nathan. Uh, the next question I'm going to put to Vittorio. Uh, this one comes from David1089 on Twitter. He asks, who would you make your manager of the season? I know there's still a week to go, but so far, based on, of course, what we've seen so far, who would be your manager of the season, Vittorio? I think you have to go with Gasperini. Because as we were saying, Atalanta is fighting for the Champions League, but they don't have that quality players. Uh, you know, Juventus has the best team, Napoli and Inter are there. I, I think with another manager, Atalanta would arrive below Sampdoria. So I think he has to go with Gasper. And let's not forget that uh, Atalanta was in Europe League and reached the final in Coppa Italia. So it, it has been an unbelievable season for 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 Atalanta. The, the question would be, do you think Gasperini is now ready for a big team? He already failed with Inter. There are a lot of reasons why he failed there. I thought Atalanta was the right dimension for Gasperini. I'm not sure if he steps up and go to Roma, as there are a lot of rumors to Gasperini linked to Roma. That would be the perfect solution for him. But this year with Atalanta, he, he has been unbelievable. Adam, would you, uh, would you agree with Vittorio on that? I would totally agree because I think Atalanta's success is Gasparini. I think we've seen since he's been there and he got him in the Europa League, then he got him on the verge of the Champions League and he's done that while he's lost. He's lost Caldara, Spinazzola, uh, Kessie, Gagliardini, player after player after player and, and their midfield looks better than ever. He's, he's taken away uh, Kessie and Gagliardini who were starting together and, and he hasn't got either of them anymore. And the midfield looks better with a, a collection of random players who could just be like made up names for me, like Hatteboa and Goosens and, and all those other guys. It, it's incredible. And that's entirely down to the way that Gasparini has them playing. He has to be the manager of the season. And as for the question about him moving on, I think it'd be a huge mistake from him. I think going to a, a bigger club like he did when he went to Inter you don't get the time to get your methods working. You don't get the the, the the benefit of the doubt. You don't get big name players won't really buy into what you're selling. And and Gasparini needs players who are fully committed to his vision. And we see that with a, a guy like Ilicic. I think if the rumors of him going to Napoli are true, I think we're going to see a, a return of the Ilicic who moped around a bit at Fiorentina and, 
and only played well when it was a big game on TV on a Sunday night because Gasparini's really got him playing every week. Um, and, and the same could probably be true of Zapata as well. And I think if you try and take Gasparini and, and implant him into a big team, I think the expectation that comes with being a big team where, like you look at this season, if Atalanta miss out on Champions League, but they keep Gasparini, they'll just keep going. They'll be the same next year. They'll be fifth or sixth and they'll wait for one of the big teams to slip up and maybe they can get Champions League again. If he goes to Milan or Roma or Lazio or wherever and he finishes fifth, not fourth, they'll sack him and move on again. And and he won't have gained anything for that. And then he'll have to find another home. I think it's a perfect marriage for him at, at, at Atalanta, just like it was for him at Genoa the first time around. And I, I really think he should just stay there and, and keep doing what he's doing. I think he's he's making Italian football exciting. He's he's churning out player after player after player who help other teams and then Atalanta keep rolling on. I, I just think it's the perfect solution for him to stay there. Great stuff. Can't disagree with that either. Uh, guys, we've come to the end of the show. We're approaching the hour mark. Uh, so a big thank you to both of you. Vittorio, do you want to let our listeners know how they can follow you on social media? Well, yes. So on Twitter, you can follow me at, at Vittorio Campa. And same thing on Facebook, Vittorio Campanile. Uh, and if you want on YouTube, I have my YouTube channel, Vittorio Campanile, where I talk mainly about Lazio. Great stuff. Adam, do you want to let people know how they can follow you and keep up to date with your fantastic work? Yeah, you can find me on Facebook with my name, Adam Digby. You can find me on Twitter, ADZ77 or ADZ77, if you happen to be American. Um, and, and I post all my articles and stuff there, so find me there. Brilliant stuff. Thank you to both of you. And uh, we'll be back next week where we'll be dissecting the action and the big stories from the final weekend in Serie A. So stay tuned uh, and make sure you're back next week. And until then, guys, ciao.